So thanks everyone for joining us for today's DCMB seminar. Um, good afternoon, it's a nice sunny day, although a little bit chilly um, here in Michigan. So today I am extremely pleased to be able to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kaven ward kevinus from the Environmental Protection Agency uh, and UNC. Uh, so Dr. ward kevinus received his undergrad degree from Tulane University in Louisiana and his PhD in computational biology and bioinformatics uh, from Duke University, studying gene environment interactions and cardiovascular disease. Uh, after graduating in 2014, he then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Helmholtz Institute in Munich, Germany, studying the molecular mechanisms and environmental risks of cardiovascular disease and accelerated aging. Uh, his postdoc work uh, was very interesting and includes some very highly cited publications on meta-analyses of the DNA methylation and transcriptional landscapes of aging. Uh, currently, his lab uses molecular, um, specifically genomics, epigenomics, and metabolomics data and electronic health record data to understand molecular mechanisms of environmental exposures. So these exposures include both chemical and social neighborhood factor type exposures. And his work has been, had a special focus on vulnerable populations. Uh, he's currently PI of the EPA CARES Research Resource. Uh, CARES stands for the Clinical and Archived Records Research for Environmental Studies. Uh, and in this role, he helps EPA work with health healthcare providers to study air pollution and heart disease risk and other clinical endpoints using EHR data. So uh, without any further delay, let's give him a warm welcome uh, to today's speaker. Um, and again, thank you for coming, at least virtually, to Ann Arbor to be with us today. All right, thank you for the excellent introduction and thank you all uh, for the invitation to speak with you, um, Pierre. So, as I said, I'm currently a principal investigator at the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, where I've uh, began this research program, although it's a continuation of uh, many years of research that I've been doing um, up until now. And I think it's um, really a continuation of the arc that environmental health is going, where you're moving towards a more um, personalized and precision medicine world um, that really reflects the goals of genomics um, and public health in general. Um, so I'm going to begin by discussing electronic health records um, and air pollution epidemiology um, and how electronic health records in general are really changing the way um, that we do a lot of environmental studies or changing how we can um, perceive the environmental effects on uh, various vulnerable populations in particular. Um, so to start off the talk, I'd like to um, orient us a little bit to sort of one of the central ideas of environmental health that doesn't get discussed um, in as much detail as I think it um, should be, which is the idea that there are both a range of exposures and a range of um, vulnerabilities to any given um, environmental exposure. Uh, much of my work centers around air pollution, um, specifically particulate matter, uh, where certainly where I do the bulk of my work um, these days. However, I think this is actually an applicable scenario um, to a wide variety of both chemical um, as well as non-chemical um, exposures, such as social determinants of health. Um, and it really applies any time where you have um, an exposure, which perhaps for young, healthy individuals who are going to comprise the majority um, of an affected population, um, you see fairly mild effects. So in the case of um, air pollution, um, the widest subset of the population is affected, which are the generally healthy um, individuals. I'm only going to experience, you know, fairly mild um, subclinical effects, we call them, such as lung function decrements, inflammation, and cardiac effects um, for that. And the magnitude of impacts in terms of individuals would be millions, um, but the overall magnitude of impacts to our public health or our health systems um, for there um, might not be as you know, large as for other individuals. Um, but as you move up the pyramid um, and you get to smaller proportions of the population affected um, in there, um, but you get to more severe health effects, um, for it, um, then you start to move into things that we actually are studying in our mom, the interest to us in our typical manuscripts, things like doctor visits, um, loss of um, productivity or schoolwork, um, and then moving up to ER visits, hospital admissions, heart attacks, and even death. 
um, for there. And DEF is um, responsible for about 90% of the monetized benefits from uh, federal regulations like the Clean Air Act. Um, and the Clean Air Act is you know, widely known as one of the most economically beneficial um, federal regulations that exist um, in terms of its monetized benefit to the population. Um, however, the discrepancy comes, or um, the discrepancy that I see it, um, when we know that death is generally only occurring for the most vulnerable individuals, those with pre-existing disease um, or some environmental sensitivity um, to there, particularly um, in areas of the country, um, such as North Carolina, where I do a lot of my studies, um, where the air quality is generally very good um, and below you know, current national um, standards um, for there. Um, but our studies generally are mostly composed of the bottom of the pyramid. And so we aren't targeting our studies to actually quantify you know, the health effects in the population that is experiencing those health effects um, for there. Um, and this may mean that we're both underestimating um, the health effects within these vulnerable populations. Um, and we also may be missing very important health effects that simply aren't going to be seen um, in the general population, but will be of great magnitude um, in a more selected, more vulnerable population uh, for there. And of course, this is you know, of global interest, not just United States interest, um, given that air pollution alone as an environmental exposure um, is, been res is responsible for about 3.3 million premature deaths, um, a number that's rising mostly due to uh, continued poor air quality um, in some developing countries, um, but um, also rising due to the changing demographics of our population um, with the aging population. Uh, we expect to be moving more people um, up the rungs of this pyramid um, and thus have a greater need to study the health effects um, in these specific um, smaller populations, um, but ones that experience the health um, effects that are of greatest interest to us um, from a public health sense. Um, so with that in mind, um, I think it's worth to understand exactly what it is we're going to, I'm going to be talking about for the next few slides here um, for it. And so you know, air pollution is a very heterogeneous mixture um, of both gases and particulate matter um, for there. Um, the common gases um, that we'll see in air pollution are gonna be SO2, um, CO2, um, greenhouse gases, and our sort of traffic byproducts, um, smog precursors um, for there. The gases that gave Los Angeles a sort of characteristic yellow haze um, back in its early days um, for there and has been prevalent throughout the Hollywood movie scene ever since um, for it. Um, but then on the other side, beyond the gases, uh, we also have the particulate matter itself uh, for there. And this is a bit of a scaled image for you to understand just what we mean when we say fine particulate matter. Uh, we were talking about very fine scales, um, whereas the beach sand is about 90 micrometers and the human hair might be 50 to 70, 50 on the um, low end there. Um, PM 2.5 is particulate matter is less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter uh, for there. And so, at that size, um, studies have shown that it's able to actually penetrate the nasal and upper airway defenses, um, diffuse down into the lung uh, from inhalation. And from there, set off a host of systemic um, effects, mostly driven by oxidative stress. Um, a lot of it triggered by um, some of the metals and chemical compounds that get absorbed to the surfaces of these particles. Um, and from there, are able to exert effects not just on the lung, um, but we now see um, particulate matter effects on everything from um, the brain to the heart, um, the kidneys, even the gastrointestinal systems. Um, so there's really no aspect of human health that is not touched on um, by these fine particulates. Um, so for the first study that I want to talk about, um, it's an investigation that we did linking um, health, electronic health records from heart failure patients um, with PM 2.5 exposure um, throughout the state of North Carolina. Um, we wanted, did this to try and understand mortality and morbidity um, in them. And we did it in collaboration um, with the Carolina Data Warehouse for Health, um, which is a, an electronic health re record resource that is centered at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill uh, for there. So um, we worked together with the Carolina Data Warehouse um, to gather electronic health records on about 40,000 um, individuals who are diagnosed with heart failure between 2004 and 2016. Um, and then we combined that, um, we turned that into an actual ongoing resource now uh, that we call EPA CARES um, by linking those with a host of environmental exposures. We began with um, PN 2.5, um, both from our EPA ground-based regulatory monitoring system, 
um, but also from some machine learning models um, through some collaborators that we have um, that incorporate things like uh, meteorology, um, satellite monitoring or aerial optical depth, um, which is the actual depth that a beam of light uh, from orbiting satellites is able to penetrate um, through the upper atmosphere. Um, and it gives us a measure of uh, the amount of particulate matter in a column of air um, for there. Um, and even land use regression variables like the um, street and roadway networks and the location of industries um, for there. Um, and combine those into a high resolution, um, about one kilometer resolution spatial map of air pollution exposure data. Um, now, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with cardiovascular diseases, you may be wondering why we chose heart failure uh, for there. Uh, we chose that simply because it is one of the most growing and prevalent um, forms of cardiovascular disease in the United States, um, unlike some other ones like uh, coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease. Uh, the prevalence of heart failure is actually um, increasing within the United States um, for there. Um, it is now the most common diagnosis in individuals that are 65 years or older, um, representing about one out of eight deaths and expected to affect about one in 33 uh, total individuals, um, not just one in 33 adults, but a complete prevalence of um, about 3% in the US by 2030. Um, and of course the healthcare costs are enormous uh, for this disease, um, costing about $30.7 billion annually, um, projected to almost double um, over, the next few, um, over the next decade or so. Um, and so this is what our data looked like uh, when we mapped our patients geographically uh, for there. Um, now this is an electronic health record cohort, uh, meaning that all of our observations came through hospital systems. Um, so naturally, most of our density of individuals is going to come from the places where there are hospitals. Um, and generally, they place hospitals in cities. And so uh, there's a you know, over-representation of urbanized areas, um, although we do have good representation of some very rural areas um, out here in eastern North Carolina as well. Uh, in the yellow triangles is the EPA air monitoring network, um, which we used in conjunction with our uh, satellite monitoring or our modeled air pollution data. Um, and you see there's a pretty good correlation between the two of those, um, simply because the EPA also puts monitors where people are, um, and so they happen to oftentimes be co-located um, in urban centers along with um, hospital systems. Um, and this is what the air quality looked like for North Carolina. Um, now the top graph has a lot of bright red spots um, throughout it. Now we're looking at the um, annual average of PM 2.5, that fine particulate that's less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter uh, for the year 2004, and then a bottom graph the year 2016, so the sort of bookend years um, for our study there. Um, and I mentioned the bright red areas because, you know, those are the areas of elevated um, air pollution um, in here, but they are still very, very much um, near to the um, current EPA standards, so the most current EPA national ambient air quality standards for annual average PM 2.5 um, uh, went into effect in 2012. Um, even back in 2014, the maximum uh, air quality um, PM 2.5 exposure that we saw in North Carolina um, on an annual basis was about 19 micrograms per cubic meter um, for there. And in 2016, there are almost no areas that are above uh, the 12 microgram per cubic meter standard. So this is a wonderful state to study, both because we do have some exposure heterogeneity across the state, um, but we also are generally right around the border or below the EPA's uh, current national air ambient quality standards, um, allowing us to study exposures that are at that level or below it, um, which have some of the greatest public health relevance um, as we think about, you know, how to generate evidence that our standards are both working um, or perhaps need to be revised. Um, so our first study was actually a study of mortality, um, which came out um, back in 2020, um, just last year um, for it. We began this work in 2017 um, when I joined the EPA um, for there. And, it, you know, if you've done any work with electronic health records, um, it takes a little bit of time to get them together until we're there in an analytic ready frame. And so we're really starting to hit the ground now um, with these studies. Our second study uh, looked at hospital visits and readmissions. Um, and actually is the first study of long-term exposures and hospital readmissions um, for air pollution that I'm aware of, um, at least. And so we decided on this for our second study. Our first study, we just wanted something that we could understand 
validate you know what had been seen before. For our second one, we really wanted to push the envelope a little bit um, for there. And because most current studies of hospitalizations are short-term exposures, um, we wanted to focus books on a long-term exposure, um, as well as bring into um, account some of the, the readmission timeframes, which are hard to capture if you don't have that continual electronic health record going on. Um, so in the end, we had about 440,000 visits from about 20,000 or 20,920 um, heart failure patients um, for there. Um, we use a fairly standard, actually a quasi-Poisson um, regression model, um, adjusting for a range of confounders, age, race, sex, distance to the nearest um, air pollution monitor, which is also a very good measure of urbanicity um, are there. Um, urbanicity itself at the census block group level, um, a year of heart failure diagnosis, um, and some neighborhood level socioeconomic status and county level variables um, that capture things like access to healthcare, um, crime rates, access to healthy foods, other um, social determinants of health um, that might be important um, as they co-vary both with um, air pollution exposure and with the likelihood of you know even being able to go to a hospital um, and thus you know have a visit recorded or have a readmission. Um, and we used inverse probability weights um, to try and add some causal interpretations. Um, for there, as well as adjust for the competing risk of death um, in our models. Um, and this is what our study cohort looked like. Um, so our mean age is about 70 years old um, for there. Um, our entire study cohort, as well as our inpatient admission cohort, um, which also comprises a cohort of individuals that are eligible for our readmissions um, study, uh, were both very similar um, in their demographics um, for there. Um, people who had at least one inpatient readmission um, did seem um, to be a little bit um, sicker than the entire study cohort, have a few uh, more total visits um, on there, uh, had a slightly, but not uh, really relevantly, um, higher PM 2.5 exposure there, um, and otherwise were fairly similar uh, demographically. Um, and this is what we saw in our study um, for there. Um, this is actually a answer one. So I use the term hospital visits, um, most of the time in the literature, when you see people studying hospitalizations, you know, in response to um, whether it be a molecular factor um, or, you know, a particular policy change or an environmental factor um, for there, what they are talking about are inpatient hospital admissions. Um, and the reason for this is that those are historically been a bit better recorded. Um, accessing the data has been uh, more relevant for them. Um, and they're relevant for both short-term and long-term exposures. As I said before, most of the previous studies have been short-term on there. Um, but the vast majority of hospital visits are actually just outpatient admissions. Um, and I think outpatient admissions are particularly relevant because they give you an idea of how much is the hospital usage increasing? How much is a person having to go to a hospital, not necessarily for um, something that results in an inpatient admission, um, but just for general health concerns um, that come up in there. Um, and so this has been one of the first studies that really looked at the entire spectrum of hospital admissions, including outpatient, inpatient, and emergency room um, visits. Um, and what we observed was, you know, not wholly unexpected. Um, substantial increases in our overall cohort, um, our various subsets of our cohort are particularly on the bottom. So for everybody, uh, we observe about a 9%, 9.5% increase um, in hospital visits per one microgram increase in PM2.5 um, for there. Um, this went down slightly, um, but was still elevated, um, even in areas that were below the current national ambient air quality standards um, for there. Um, we did note that visits were higher amongst higher income communities, likely reflecting their greater access um, to healthcare resources, um, but were higher in people that had an earlier age of heart failure diagnosis. Um, and we'll touch a little bit more on that um, a bit later in there. Uh, we noted higher associations among African-American participants um, for their um, and slightly higher um, associations amongst uh, non-rural um, participants, so urban individuals as opposed to um, our rural participants there, um, and a very strong differences by sex, uh, which we're still working to understand um, a bit more. Um, now, when we went to 30-day readmissions, um, we know it's a similar story, um, at least with our overall associations, um, a very significant um, increase there uh, for it. Um, with associations in about the 13% increase, 13% uh, increase per one microgram per community year increase in annual average PM 2.5 um, for it. Um, if those numbers sound large to you, um, you know, uh, the average PM 2.5 in our area was about 10 um, for it. So one represented about a 10% change 
um, in there. Um, it's also, you know, about one half of the IQR um, for our region. Um, those numbers are large. They are larger than honestly what we expected um, for there. And so what we did uh, within our study, which has been accepted for publication um, and should come out soon, um, is we started to look at, okay, well, you know, what if we simply tried to recapitulate, you know, the study design that other studies have done that have looked at sort of PM 2.5 exposure and inpatient emissions um, there. And we actually, when we did that, we saw exactly the same result. Maureen is, uh, you know, maybe we ought to just email. Do you want to email him and just see if he can restart? Or yeah, yeah, maybe. I wasn't sure if if I was frozen or if he was. Frozen. I know. I saw. <laughs> I thought. I thought. <laughs> oh my! You see it happen on like CNN, you know, or these guys. But he just got frozen. Well, uh, it happens in uh, meetings often. Yeah. yeah. Oh, looks like he got kicked off. So maybe I'll start up again. Interesting talk so far, you know, it's just, um, it's, I really want to know more about that, it, that difference between males and females was pretty, pretty big. Yeah. Uh, Apollo. Oh, there he is. All right. <laughs> I am back. I'm not sure how long I was gone. There's a pretty oh. heavy thunderstorm going on outside my house. Oh, so I think it's, oh no. <laughs> it's okay. We, uh, but no problem. If you're kicked off, just come right back again yeah. and, uh, Good. Your We're, slides again. The talk's going great. You keep going. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't right. sure if if I was frozen or you were frozen, so it happens to all of us. Yep. All right. Let's begin again. I think I was around the thirty day readmissions when I got kicked off. Yeah. Yeah. You're on that slide. On that slide. Okay. So I will start the sharing again from there. And I I think you you had presented a lot of it already. I present a lot of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, the final thing I want to say about this, this slide is that the one of the reasons why we were so interested in examining um, this particular outcome is that hospital systems are penalized um, based on the number of excess 30 day readmissions um, for there. This is something that's been part of the Affordable Care Act um, and has resulted in tens of millions of dollars um, in penalties um, applied to hospitals. Um, based on the number of excess 30-day readmissions. And so um, we view this as a way of really getting a broad body interested in environmental health, um, whereby this is not just relevant for patients because nobody wants to be going to the hospital less than a month after they were just discharged, um, but also hospital systems um, who don't want to be facing millions or tens of million dollars in penalties um, due to excess 30-day readmissions due to poor air quality in their areas. And so um, we think this is going to be a really great means um, to keep a broader uh, cohort engaged on this very important topic. Um, so we looked at emissions beyond 30 days. 30-day readmissions are a relatively arbitrary cutoff choice, um, with although one that stuck around much like P less than 0.05 um, has for there. Um, but we see very similar patterns of associations. The magnitude certainly changes. Um, for there, and I think most of that has to do with the baseline prevalence. Um, Seven-day readmissions are fairly rare um, for there, um, and we are where we sort of note the largest increase, but also the largest standard error um, within there um, for it. Um, 30 days look very similar to both 60 and 90-day readmissions um, in terms of overall magnitude, so we think this is probably um, a fairly general phenomenon um, for there and not simply dependent on the 30-day cutoff. Um, and for all of them, we simply don't see associations below uh, that 12 microgram per cubic meter um, standard. Um, so now, um, having laid a stage for that, I want to, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, the power of electronic health records. So, I mean, we can clearly see that we can, for the first time, study at scale, you know, vulnerable patient populations. And, you know, I think that's, you know, worth highlighting again is that this is really the first study um, that didn't simply examine heart failure patients as a subset of the general population, um, which is hard to do because 
with even with only 2% prevalence, you can imagine the sample size you would need to collect to have 40,000 heart failure patients show up uh, for a cohort study in there. Um, and then given their general, you know, uh, more severe health state, it's oftentimes harder to get them in, um, into these studies. Um, but the electronic health records, I think, can go a lot further beyond that. Um, it can even start to touch on some of the things like gene environment interactions. Um, so these interactions are actually quite prevalent um, throughout the literature, although there aren't you know, very many studies of them um, on there. Um, generally, if you look at you know, uh, major environmental exposure um, and some cardiovascular disease, there is oftentimes going to be at least some hint um, that there might be some genetic stratification to risk um, of exposure uh, for there. And I think we've seen hints of that, you know, even in the data we presented um, here, as I mentioned, you know, our associations were generally stronger um, for people who have a, a earlier onset um, heart failure um, for that. Um, that's oftentimes seen um, as an indicator for genetic risk um, in there. Generally, the earlier onset of cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease in particular, um, the greater the genetic risk uh, for it. Um, and I think we see that also with our general sex differences. I mean, these can be, you know, differences that we saw between males and females, which is our largest difference, um, certainly could be driven by, you know, patterns of activity at home versus, you know, being away um, for it or differences in exposure. Um, but it might also be driven by clearly underlying genomic differences, be those, you know, genetic, epigenetic, um, or other factors um, that we need to understand uh, for there. Um, and I think some of the common challenges of gene environment interactions are limited by, you know, the power you can tap into with electronic health records, um, the expense of genotyping, complexity of the study, sample size of there. I mean, the studies don't get any less complex um, for there, but I think there are ways to cover, overcome some of the other two um, for there. Um, and while direct genomic information is being added to EHRs, um, the Michigan Genomics Initiative um, being one of the premier sources of that, um, for there, it's not entirely common, uh, which is why we've now turned to family history um, because it's both commonly assessed in electronic health records um, and is a known useful indicator of genomic risk. Um, so for this study, we looked at you know, family history as an indicator for genetic risk for various chronic diseases. Um, we looked at cancer history, cardiovascular disease, metabolic, respiratory, um, and a few others. Um, we examined both a binary indicator, um, so whether there was an affected family member or not, um, as well as a family history score um, created by summing the coefficient relationship for each affected family member um, for that. Um, and we used simply a multiplicative interaction model that was layered on top of our existing. The approach needs a better um, score because it's it, essentially repeating. Uh, Basantha, can you mute yourself, please? Um, Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so we layered a multiplicative interaction model on top of our existing epidemiological model for 30-day um, readmissions and hospital visits um, in order to understand if there was actually a statistical difference between people who had a family history of a disease versus um, did not in terms of their associate, the association between PN2.5 exposure um, and hospital utilization for these individuals. Um, and so this is what our histogram of our sort of family relationships look like. Um, up on the top here, we have the uh, frequency distribution of the coefficient relationship, um, which measures the identity by descent um, for there. So identi how identical um, two genomes um, are in terms of their identity with a common ancestor um, for it, sort of a formal definition. Um, also simply it can be thought of as a degree of shared genetic um, sequence between two individuals. Um, for, you know, different family um, diseases, here cardiovascular disease um, and over here cancer uh, for it. And most people, um, so you recall, we had 12,000, uh, we had 20,000 individuals in there. Um, most people actually do not um, have a fairly low family history of disease. So 0.5, um, which would be a parent or a child or a sister or a brother um, having it. Um, but we do have people who seem to have um, a fairly substantial affected uh, family history, uh, some coefficient of 2.5 um, in there, which would you know, be the equivalent of having you know, two parents and perhaps a couple of siblings um, and a grandparent or an aunt or uncle um, who was affected um, for their um, cardiovascular disease was by far our most reported 
um, family history of disease in terms of the total, you know, the maximum coefficient relationship as well as the, you know, total people. Um, simply reflecting that, you know, cardiovascular disease is a major risk factor for uh, heart failure, uh, which is the population we continue to study here. Um, so this is a bit of our breakdown um, of our diseases. Uh, you see 27% of individuals had a history of cardiovascular disease, which replicates what we know um, based on the sort of uh, family history of disease statistics um, that we see for heart failure patients. Um, but we see a variety um, of diseases of, you know, clinical conditions being reported in the family history um, of there. Um, and this is what we see when we ran our interaction models um, for it. So we looked at for total visits, um, outpatient, inpatient, and emergency visits um, in this um, particular analysis um, of there. Uh, the y-axis represents the actual interaction term. Um, so this is the percent increase or potentially decrease, how we've seen that. Uh, but the percent increase uh, for somebody who has a family history um, as compared to somebody who does not um, in their association um, with PN2.5. So um, recall that our baseline association was already relatively high at about 10 um, to 11% um, for there. Now we're adding an extra 10% relative, not absolute magnitude, um, but still um, highly relevant um, for these populations. Um, and very suggestive of the idea that, you know, this both that gene environment interactions can be uncovered using electronic health records and point in the directions that we expected, um, greater risk with greater um, genetic risk, greater environmental risk with greater um, genetic background risk for these um, uh, various diseases, um, and also uh, can be seen across multiple um, health outcomes or multiple types of hospital utilization um, there. Um, we really expected to see cardiovascular disease. Um, we weren't sure we would see when we looked at other diseases. Cancer, um, if anything, was about as strong, if not even stronger than cardiovascular disease um, in there, at least for total visits. Um, and really, I think, starts to speak towards the um, sort of multimorbidity, the interconnected systems um, that are at play here. Um, now, obviously, if you're looking at this, the first thought we should have is, you know, probably some type of linkage under the inflammatory system, um, as inflammation is known to drive both cardiovascular disease and cancer. Um, and that's exactly what we hope to do um, by targeting some of these family history to disease. Um, family history is a very crude genetic tool to use to uncover gene environment interactions, although very useful as it's much easier to ask somebody what their family history of disease is um, than to do a sequencing project or even you know, the latest Illumina uh, genochip. Um, but it doesn't give us a lot of genomic region specificity or any at all um, for there. And so the hope is by layering these, um, and you know, a lot of these have very, very well mapped um, genetic risk loci, um, we can start to understand um, potentially some of the genomic regions that overlap between cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, and some of the other ones that show associations, um, and then use that to do follow-up targeted studies um, that may be more both economically and logistically feasible um, than trying to do whole genome um, wide association studies on uh, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of uh, hospital patients. Um, we also see these with our readmissions. Uh, we didn't see it as strongly or at least not statistically significant if we're gonna uh, use these p -val, arbitrary p-value cutoffs um, for it, but we do see it you know, fairly strongly uh, with, well, with good precision for 90 day um, as well as seven day readmissions um, for it. Now our percent changes here are huge um, for there. And I think it more reflects a bit more of the rarity of our outcome um, when it comes to there. Um, you start layering on family history of ischemic disease um, along with 90 day and seven day or seven day or 30 or 60 day readmissions. Um, some of your cell counts get low. Um, that gets reflected in our wide you know, confidence intervals, you know, particularly if you look at the seven day readmissions, which ranges from like 20 to 100 in there, um, as well as, you know, perhaps a slight elevation um, in there. And the hope is that, you know, if we can, we're working with other hospital systems now where we might be able to replicate some of these um, and get a little bit more targeting um, and hopefully come a little bit closer um, to a, under the, the actual generalizable um, association effect estimate here. Um, now, I only have a few more minutes um, for it, about 20 more minutes. Um, so the last sort of half of my talk, 
um, I want to go through epigenetic biomarkers, uh, which comprise a large um, part of my research as well, um, and talk about them um, specifically in relation to the built environment and health. So we're going to switch tracks a little bit from thinking about air pollution um, and now consider the built environment, um, which is very much connected to social determinants of health um, as well, uh, which has become a growing aspect of my, my research program um, and a thankfully increasing um, recognized factor in environmental health uh, in general. Um, so for me, this research really picked up um, back in 2017, um, later in the year, um, I came across a study of a life expectancy in um, Los Angeles County um, for there. Um, the first thing that jumped out to me is that Los Angeles County has really great life expectancy um, at 82.1 years um, for it. Um, to put that in perspective, there are various states lifted here, North Carolina, where I live, down here at 78.3, so I might need to consider a change of address um, at the very least. Um, and if it, LA County were considered its own country, it would have like the 11th highest life expectancy in the world uh, for it. Um, but then we juxtapose that with the map on the right-hand side, which shows that there's a pretty large discrepancy in life expectancy across what's a fairly small geographic area. Um, you know, LA County is not the not a tiny city, um, but when you're talking about something like life expectancy um, for there, you don't expect necessarily to see such strong differences, you know, across these various areas. Um, and you can even see it, you know, even more detailed if you um, look at, you know, very nearby areas. Um, this is Walnut Park um, in a neighborhood called Kudahi. Um, Walnut Park actually has the highest life expectancy in all of LA County at 90.5 years. Um, so really a great place to live. Uh, Kudahi has amongst, you know, the lowest, or at least in the bottom, you know, quartile at least, at 79.2 years. Um, uh, and these neighborhoods are located only a 15-minute walk from each other um, there. And they have actually very similar demographics, um, heavily uh, Latino neighborhoods, um, similar age distribution, uh, similar incomes, uh, similar education um, for there. Um, the main difference is there's a bit higher home ownership in Walnut Park. Um, I suppose of Kudahi. Um, and then there's some environmental differences. Walnut Park is named for a large park um, that exists that's sort of just off the screen here. Um, Kudahi, meanwhile, is bordered by the Los Angeles River, um, which I believe is still used for some uh, shipping um, for there. And then this very large uh, highway um, here that borders just over the city. Um, and it's opposed to a park. Uh, Kudahi has a Kudahi Mall, um, which is located there, uh, which contributes both to traffic um, as well as, you know, a certain lack of potential green space uh, within there. Uh, but then finally, the city noted back in 2010, uh, this assessment was done in 2017, um, that illegal and hazardous material waste dumping uh, was a concern within the city uh, for there, which to me points towards, you know, potentially environmental factors. Now, even I, as an environmental scientist, could not expect that environmental factors could account for this large of a discrepancy, um, but it can account for parts of it. And my question is, you know, how can we study this? You know, at the time point at which you know it occurs, it's a little bit too late um, right now to start to fix it. But can we start detecting it earlier? Um, and if we start making interventions, if we bulldoze Kudahi Mall and put in a giant park, you know, how can we say that those interventions are working on a time scale that matters to the people um, that are living in the neighborhood? Um, and one of the areas I think that it's you know particularly useful for this is epigenetic aging. Um, so epigenetic aging is a means for determining the biological age of an individual um, or cell or tissue, because you're really measuring at the cellular scale um, for their um, using DNA methylation, specifically some of the Illumina arrays, the 27K, the 450K, and their newest, their EPIC array, which assesses 850,000 um, DNA methylation loci um, for there. Um, it's been strongly linked with environmental exposures and health risks, um, and thus may explain um, some of these links. Um, and importantly, it changes on timescales that are particularly relevant and studyable on timescales of years, months, um, potentially even days, depending on the severity of the exposure um, that we're talking about. And so it's a very useful quantitative biomarker um, that's more correlated with age than some of our historical ones like telomere um, and also more strongly associated with some of the health outcomes we're most interested when studying aging, like the incidence of chronic disease uh, and mortality. Um, so for my investigation into this area, I looked at the Detroit Neighborhood Health Study um, for it. Um, my purpose was to understand 
if there is a link between neighborhood quality and some of these epigenetic aging biomarkers um, for there. Um, we looked at 157 individuals um, and compared, you know, a couple of models um, for there, one with our sort of standard epidemiological, you know, adjustment, looking at our standard um, confounders there. Um, and then another one that additionally adjusted for um, the perception of the neighborhood, um, because this might be a very important confounder that's not present in other studies. Um, most people don't have an intrinsic perception of air quality. Um, they would like the air to be as clean as possible, but if the sky is blue, they're generally okay with it. Um, even if the air quality might not, might be, you know, worse or better for them on that day as it was the day before. Um, but with neighborhood quality, we definitely have a perception uh, variable that's important to capture and understand. Um, and we looked at three epigenetic aging biomarkers um, and stratified on sex, um, and then some neighborhood indicators of green space because green space um, has been projected to have a very big salutogenic or beneficial effect uh, on neighborhoods. Um, and so these are the biomarkers that we looked at. Uh, one was the age acceleration difference, uh, sort of the original epigenetic biomarker, um, aging biomarker, the most commonly used certainly. Um, it's tissue agnostic, um, which makes it very useful. So it's composed of 353 epigenetic loci, each of which has a weight. Um, and you sum those up, you multiply the weight by the um, percent methylation, sum those up, and you get a measure that can be expressed in years. Um, and actually is valid whether you're looking at blood, whether you're looking at brain, or whether you're looking at skin um, or other factors there, uh, making it very useful for aging um, uh, factor, aging uh, studies. Uh, and then we have an extrinsic epigenetic age difference. Um, this is particularly targeted towards the blood immune system. So it correlates very well with some uh, like naive CD8 T cells and other immune cell populations. Um, and then phenotypic age um, acceleration difference. Um, this one is constructed to correlate well with clinical parameters that have historically been associated with aging. Um, things like glycemic control through uh, glycated uh, hemoglobin, uh, uh, things like C-reactive protein, which assesses inflammation, um, in there, um, and some of the other lipid biomarkers that um, change fairly consistently with aging. Um, to uh, assess the neighborhoods, we turned them in, we looked at 19 different neighborhood indicators, um, which were assessed by trained assessors um, on there. So these people were, did not live in a neighborhood. Um, they were just recruited by the study um, staff, and then given a set of things to go look at, everything from the abandoned cars, people being on the street, the presence of large mature trees, um, and then say, you know, what prevalence those were um, in these different neighborhoods. Um, two of them went out um, and did each neighborhood, and then those were average to create them. Um, we took them and did a principal components analysis because we know there's a high correlation amongst them. Um, and that's what you see on the x-axis of this graph here uh, from PC1 through PC9. PC1 capturing the majority of the variation. Uh, PC9, you know, capturing a relatively small percentage of the variation. Um, and we capped it at nine, so because that captured 90% of the overall variation within the data, uh, which is a fairly common cutoff for our principal components analyses. Um, and we did observe very strong association with PC7, um, interestingly, so not our strongest one, but actually uh, association that we've now replicated using other um, epigenetic biomarkers. It seems to be quite consistent um, for there. Um, and the association was quite consistent across our three epigenetic aging biomarkers, suggesting that um, a standard deviation increase in this principal component um, was associated with two or more years of accelerated aging, um, a quite substantial um, aging amount. Um, and the primary drivers of this principal component um, were factors that are associated with neighborhood disadvantage, um, abandoned cars, um, people being on the street. Um, there was an inverse associated with alcohol advertising, um, which you believe might simply point to the cheap land available um, to be able to put um, near there. Um, it might also reflect um, the fact that major highways are often built through disadvantaged neighborhoods. Um, and that's oftentimes where you'll see um, highway advertising um, is nearby, you know, some of these disadvantaged neighborhoods that have cheap land um, and major highways cutting through them. Um, we saw positive associations with graffiti and the street being poor condition, uh, which overall point to a general socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhood um, that seems to be associated with accelerated aging across multiple biomarkers. Um, these associations do not differ by sex um, and were not affected by the perception of the neighborhood. So um, interestingly enough, in the study, most people liked the neighborhood that they lived in um, for it, um, which is, you know, very, very uh, 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 interesting phenomenon that we necessarily did not expect. You know, this is a study of Detroit post-economic collapse. 
Um, and still about 80% of the people both liked their neighborhood and found it to be socially cohesive. Um, these are also long-term residents, which also might obviously would clearly seem to correlate with that. If you're a resident of a neighborhood for 20 years, you're more likely to like their neighborhood. But whether you liked or disliked your neighborhood did not seem to correlate or it seemed to affect our association um, there. And as I said, our association was consistent across the sexes, um, but much more precise amongst the females, which is a phenomenon we're seeing a lot uh, within here, um, which we think might have something to do um, both with the epigenetic risk itself, um, as well as potentially the relationship between um, neighborhood conditions um, and women um, within these neighborhoods, um, in particular, as opposed to um, the men within these neighborhoods, um, something that we're still working to understand in terms of social cohesion um, and some of these other factors that might be playing a role. Uh, when we stratified on green space, um, phenotypic age acceleration difference was the only one who showed that showed a difference, um, as you see here. Um, and the difference was in the direction that we might expect, um, where for neighborhoods that had large mature trees, um, which was uncorrelated with PC7, um, being a principal component, it contains all the uh, weighting for every um, feature of the neighborhood um, within there. Uh, but we assess the correlation between um, large mature trees and PC7 as a principal component itself. The correlation was fairly um, low, so we weren't uh, worried about multicollinearity um, when doing this. Um, and if a neighborhood had large mature trees, um, the association seemed to be eliminated, um, indicating a potential protective effect. Um, whereas the association was enhanced in neighborhoods that seem to have a low um, or below median, um, is what I mean by low here, uh, amounts of large mature trees is an indicator of green space. Um, we also saw this uh, similar direction of association with community gardens. Um, we did a study of mortality biomarker um, in here, um, indicating that this green space um, effect might be prevalent, no, not just for large mature trees, but for other um, aspects of green space. Um, and I've got 10 minutes, so the last sort of two or three minutes, I'll quickly walk you through a sort of flip side of the study. So what I just showed you was that the built environment or the neighborhood conditions uh, might accelerate aging um, within individuals who live in a neighborhood. Um, now we're gonna ask the question, well, does accelerated aging make somebody more sensitive to air pollution or chemical environmental exposures um, for their, um, this question we asked because chronological age um, has long been proposed and actually seen to be um, an indicator of individual sensitivity um, to um, child-related air pollution. Um, but chronological age is, A, you can't intervene on it. You can't simply stop somebody um, from aging. Um, but biological age, epigenetic age, is potentially intervenable. Um, they might be able to reverse it with either dietary or exercise um, or other healthy lifestyle changes um, for there. And it also seems to be affected by other environmental factors, potentially introducing a sort of vicious cycle where the built environment accelerates your aging, which makes you more sensitive to future environmental exposures, leading to health complications that might in turn accelerate your aging again, making you more and more sensitive um, as it goes along. Um, so for this, we used a study cohort. We jumped back to North Carolina, um, where we had some really good environmental assessment data um, available, as well as some methylation data from um, the CAFTIN cohort, which is a cardiac catheterization cohort. Um, we used 12 by 12 kilometer models so we could attribute air pollution to different sources, such as traffic um, or secondary organic carbons. Um, uh, we looked at uh, various vascular outcomes, peripheral arterial disease and blood pressure. Um, we selected these based on their prior associations with um, near roadways, um, which was the association I chose to study um, in here, um, both because it has strong implications for um, neighborhoods. As we said, there's been a long history in America of cutting um, through some of these uh, minority neighborhoods with highways, which overall tends to degrade the neighborhood um, and increase the amount of pollution there um, for it. And because in urban areas, traffic-related air pollution is one of the most um, prevalent forms of air pollution um, that we see. Um, our study cohort was sort of as you expected. Um, interestingly, most of them had a negative phenotypic age acceleration. Um, as I said before, this is the one that's based on clinical parameters um, for there. Um, the thinking you know, here potentially is that because these people had a cardiac catheterization, um, a lot of them are going to be medicated um, for things like you know, glycemic control, blood lipids. Um, you know, I wanna say 85% of them are probably on a statin, if not more um, for that. 
um, which might artificially or not artificially, but which might serve to lower um, some of these clinical parameters and thus the epigenetic loci associated with them and thus their phenotypic age. Um, for the Horvath age acceleration, the sort of tissue agnostic one, um, we saw the acceleration that we sort of expected uh, within there. Um, average is to a highway is about one kilometer, but gets much, much closer um, in urban areas um, for it. Um, and these people had a little bit higher blood pressure than we might want um, for there, uh, which is perfectly to be expected. Um, these are what our maps of air pollution look like. Uh, we focus mostly on the traffic sources, diesel and gasoline, um, as well as our you know, near roadways um, for there. The road network is sort of shown in the black squiggly lines um, here. Um, we also had a couple of what we call sort of negative controls, biomass burning, which you expect to be fairly low um, in there um, as well. As, um, we want to see if this was a specific association um, for traffic air pollutants. Um, and this is what we saw when we looked at our study. So uh, we saw very strong associations with peripheral arterial disease um, and age acceleration difference. Um, we saw uh, slightly limit, uh, uh, sorry, we additionally saw associations with diastolic and systolic blood pressure um, for there. Uh, diastolic blood pressure was the only one we saw um, at the P less than 0.05 cutoff, at least. Um, that was um, consistent for our age acceleration difference and our phenotypic age acceleration difference when looking at interactions between near roadways um, and accelerated aging um, there. All these associations are positive, um, indicating that for people um, with accelerated aging, the responses um, to living near a roadway in terms of the increased prevalence of arterial arterial disease um, or increases in systolic and diastolic blood pressure um, are all positive, um, which is sort of what we expected to see. Um, we could visualize this a little bit for age acceleration um, difference, at least in peripheral arterial disease. Um, and it very nicely shows how individuals in our first tertile um, who actually had a slightly negative age acceleration difference, indicating they were slightly younger um, then their chronological age um, seem to have no association or potentially even a protective effect, um, an odds ratio less than one at least um, for there. Whereas our third tertile, which has very large confidence intervals due to our you know, pretty reduced sample size um, in it, we started with only 560 individuals, uh, but we still see a very strong positive association there, um, indicating that you know, being the, having the highest tier of accelerated aging um, seems to make you the most responsive to traffic air pollution. Um, and this is why we think that we might be um, on track here with uncovering um, a potential individual level epigenetic biomarker um, that can allow us to determine, you know, potentially, you know, as we develop these studies, um, you know, individuals, you know, environmental health risk, um, which is sort of, you know, one of the holy grails of environmental health research right now. Um, so, with that, I'll conclude um, simply saying that, you know, electronic health records um, really have the sample size and clinical phenotyping um, to empower novel studies of environmental health. Um, they can even provide insights into gene environment interactions, um, which we hope to leverage and utilize long into the future. Um, and these epigenetic biomarkers really provide a unique window into understanding aging and mortality effects of the built environment and social determinants of health um, and accelerated aging biomarkers themselves might also serve as environmental sensitivity factors um, that we can assess at the individual level and that might lead us towards a more personalized or precision environmental health regime. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge all the many, many people um, who contributed to this um, work here. Um, and I'd also be happy to take any questions with the time that remains. Thank you, that was a really great talk. I have heard of the you know, the studies with um, epigenetic aging, but I hadn't heard of these large cohort studies that are being done now to assess the relationship between that and, you know, all these um, neighborhood environmental scores. Is the, is the Detroit study that you discussed, is that just an example of several studies that you're aware of that are being done using the epigenetic aging? Or do you think that's mm -hmm. a, a fairly unique study? Oh, no, certainly not unique. Um, you know, it might be unique in the particular approach we took. Um, most people don't have, you know, trained assessors looking at a neighborhood quality for it. Um, but in terms of looking at the effects of environmental exposures on epigenetic age, certainly not unique um, and not the largest. Um, I've published, you know, several others um, on air pollution 
and other factors. And there's a very rapidly growing web of research that's interested in the environmental drivers of um, epigenetic age and the sort of, you know, what I think of as the emerging tide of epigenetic biomarkers as we get these large cohorts where we can develop, you know, biomarkers for things like obesity or mortality risk, um, or for even things like, you know, diet um, that might be environmentally driven. Yeah, so maybe um, maybe the Michigan Genomics Initiative should be adding the, the uh, EPIC array to their list yeah, of assays. Is, the nice thing is, is that you don't need the EPIC array. It can be done with the 450 or the 27K array, um, depending on what you want to look at. So it's a quite flexible biomarker that's proven, you know, really useful for aging research in particular. Yeah. Um, so if anyone else has questions, you're free to unmute and, and ask, or you can type them in the chat. Okay, I have a question, Skill. Thank you. Very, really terrific uh, combination of studies you've presented today. Appreciate your speaking with us. Um, I'm interested to know whether your own work or your colleagues' work has identified any particular molecular sites for these uh, many methylations, uh, like 300 that are quantitated in this uh, epigenetic aging parameter. Is there parallel work or complementary work that's uh, identified some of these in sort of the name of uh, pollutant specific um, signatures? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there actually, there is work that's been done on that um, for there. I mean, all the sites are you know listed, so you can go in, you can look up all of them. Um, they seem to be mostly related to um, phosphorylation and cell clock. Um, regulators, um, as we might expect um, for an aging biomarker. Um, interestingly, um, I've done this and I assume others have. Also, if you break it apart, um, the associations get very, very much diminished um, for there. And so you see very strong associations in aggregate with the aggregate marker, um, but not as strong with some of the individual loci. Um, I think there's only been one study I've done where we actually saw um, associations down to the individual locus level um, for there. So it really seems to be um, a holistic quantitative biomarker um, in of itself that's not, you know, necessarily strongly driven um, by one set of loci or the other for at least the space of exposures that, you know, we've examined here. Um, now, I think there's, you know, potentially very good reasons for that. Um, I don't think it's a causal biomarker. I don't think that changing somebody's DNA methylation age as we're currently assessing it would cause them to age faster or slower. So I think it's reflective of other cellular processes and that those cellular processes are what we actually need to use this as a biomarker to target and investigate. Um, and there's a lot of research going on in that um, as well um, for it. But certainly, you know, it can be decomposed and look at its component parts and they will show associations, but generally much weaker than the overall biomarker will um, and probably lack reflecting the fact that you're looking at something that's only slightly correlated with a more causal cellular process that's actually, you know, the causal aging um, process involved in whatever outcome or exposure you want to study. Thank you, thank you. So we have a, a question on chat, um, very interesting talk. I wonder how family history variable was modeled, it ranges from 0.5 to 2.5. Was it treated as continuous? Mm. Uh, yes, uh, good question. In the slides that I presented, um, that was our binary model uh, where we simply modeled whether they had one family member or not. Um, the family relationship only went down as deep as cousins. So, um, you know, we didn't have like second cousins or third, but you know, those are fairly low sharing for it. Um, we also looked at it continuous and saw pretty concordant um, associations, not identical. Um, there were some differences there, um, but for some of our primary, you know, outcomes like cardiovascular disease, family history, the associations both pointed in the same direction um, for it. Um, and so we see similar stories, whether we treat it binary or continuous. So you've talked about, um, you know, kind of two types of studies, like linking the environmental exposures to epigenetic aging and then epigenetic aging to, to outcome. Have you considered um, doing like a mediation analysis to test for the mediating effect of epigenetics linking those two? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we have considered that. Um, we're actually working on a couple of studies that approach that um, exactly. Um, the first set looks at, you know, the mediation of um, epigenetics by various intermediate uh, clinical phenotypes. You know, epigenetic aging is associated with mortality, but it's not like that's what's killing the people. So understanding the intermediate pathways through which it might um, go and then using those intermediate pathways to determine which environmental exposures might then be some of the primary mediators um, for that. Um, and so we're at the first stage of that now, but that is um, certainly a direction that we're going. And I imagine that other labs are going to it um, as well. Yeah, <clears throat> the, the life expectancy difference between those two LA counties was, was really striking. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, Will you get the chance to look at that in the Detroit study, or do you just not have that information? Um, I hope so. Um, you know, I would love it if the city of Detroit would do a sort of life expectancy or map like LA County did, because then we could connect that with our participants and look at who lives in the highest life expectancy areas versus not, and then, you know, get a more direct tie in for it. Um, in general, I think you will see a similar story in almost every major city um, across the United States, maybe almost any, you know, decently populated area, um, even where there are going to be life expectancy difference, hopefully not as stark as we saw there, but some. And so my hope is, is that we can get some of that data, generate a similar map for an area where we have really good data, like North Carolina um, and some of our other cohort centers, and then use that in the future. But it is something I would like to um, greatly explore yeah. since it was so stark. I would guess that somebody would have that information. We, our um, MLAID Center does some work in Detroit, but also Wayne State University, um, their mm -hmm. CARES Center. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that. Um, they're in Detroit. So someone, if, if you contact someone in their CARES Center, they might be able to connect you with someone with that information. Okay, great. Yeah, no, I'm uh, not familiar with that center, but I will certainly um, look into it and the data they might have. Hi, uh, I really enjoyed your talk and you, you were bringing up that the, the, the epigenetic mark is sort of like a summary score of multiple ones, which you can't untangle. I wonder this, if there is a same situation about air pollution. I mean, you're talking about pollution as a very general term. Is there any way you can untangle, let's say pollution from traffic versus pollution from uh, uh, production facilities or from all things nearby? And I assume you would need to compare across cities, you know, some places have a, a lot more traffic and less uh, pollution from, from production facilities and other fast places may have a lot of uh, production. So is there any idea that we know what, what it could be in the air pollution? Um, yes, actually we can look at that. So, um... So this is an expanded slide that I showed before, you know, where we're looking at the interaction between um, various types of pollution um, and uh, accelerated aging um, and their effects on, you know, peripheral arterial disease here in this slide that I included. Um, and we can see that we can, you know, see associations with things like diesel generated um, PM, gasoline um, that mm -hmm. are stronger than our proximity to roadways, indicating we're getting closer to the likely acting pollutant there okay. yeah. uh, for it, um, but not as much with biomass or secondary organic carbon. Um, what you need is a really good model for the air pollution sources, which is very hard to do. Um, and you need a very large population to try and actually decompose that because they're generally so highly correlated with any one area um, that it requires large sample sizes and really good um, quality assessment. So, it's something we're starting to get to be able to do. Um, and we have a couple of studies um, now that are doing that with some of our newer air pollution models. Um, but in general, it has not been possible in the past. Well, and having lived in China, it feels like this needs to be done there because I think what you gave as average, like 17 of the PM 2.5, it's like two orders of magnitude lower than yeah. what they, I mean, they, they have generally anything below 100 is very, very rare. And so wow. <laughs> I, 
Yeah, I, I have been in 950 as the highest I've experienced. Wow. So uh, it must be a horrible thing. The question is whether they can actually get at that. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, those sort of scenarios are things you only see in wildfires here. Um, you know, we never right. see above the hundreds. 900 is, a lot of monitors don't even go that high um, that we have here. So it's, that's <laughs> well, an extreme I, I don't scenario think, for us. I'm not saying 900 as average. Oh, oh no, I mean, yeah, I, just like I've I've looked at some right. of the data out of the you know some of the China monitors, and they are very very high on you know some days, and um, you know I think that's made it an interesting place to study, particularly in these times we had effectively a global pandemic pollution control that shut down traffic and yep. factories, and so there's been a lot of interesting studies on you know, pollution reversal that have come out of there because they had the greatest magnitude possible almost on the planet where you went from extremely high to very, very low, um, particularly right. for something like the noxious gases from traffic pollution. Yeah, I was wondering, this goes back to the very beginning of your talk. Do you know what led to the um, great decrease in PM 2.5 levels from 2004 to 2016? And are, are those changes true across the country or are they specific to North Carolina? Oh, no, those are across the country um, for it. And it really was the EPA's um, na new national standard that came into effect um, for there. So the EPA instituted a new national standard um, and the national standard isn't exactly tied to the annual average. There's a lot of caveats in there, but in general, it forced you know states and regions to sharply reduce the air pollution. So the North Carolina changes aren't even as great as they you know, were seen in other areas because North Carolina generally had pretty good air quality even beforehand um, mm -hmm. for it. So you saw some areas that went, had even more drastic changes um, in air pollution than North Carolina did, um, driven by you know, the fact that EPA would have been handing out potentially large fines for areas that were out of compliance um, after 2012. Great, that's good. So they're making a difference. Well, yeah. thank you very much for your talk. Um, we really enjoyed it. And um, mm. sorry you weren't able to, to come in person, maybe some other time. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps another year. But uh, thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure to speak with all of you. Yeah, thank you too. So Thanks. We look forward to continuing the conversation. Have a good sure. one. Man. It was Bye. fun. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Maureen, for getting it set up. Yep.